So welcome everybody to today's lecture in the School of Photovoltaics and Renewable Energy Engineering. Today uh, we are joined by Pablo who will talk to us today about PV recycling um, and what SPRI needs to know. Pablo Diaz has worked in electronic waste since 2009. Uh, he has a master's and a PhD from Brazil and he joined us here at the school um, under ACAP, the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, as a research fellow in 2019. Pablo's research is on novel processes for recycling solar at the end of life. Over to you, Pablo. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Renata, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into it because we have a lot to cover in little time. So like uh, Renata said, I started working in a laboratory called LaCour. LaCour is, has a special arm dedicated to electronic waste, discovering new ways to recycle waste and to recover materials from waste. And within that group, I've pioneered and worked on PVs. So I was kind of the PV expert in that group. When I first started, this was a long time ago, there, was a, there were very scarce publications on the topic. And there's, this is obviously very good because you can, anything you do that's meaningful is already worthy of publication, but at the same time, you don't have the shoulder of giants to tend upon. So two years ago, I joined Spree, and then the situation kind of flipped because here everybody's a PV expert. And every single one of you knows way more than, about PV than I do. But what I found uh, speaking to you guys is that I had all this background on waste management and recycling that was missing here at Spree. So I thought about doing this seminar to you know, try to bridge that gap. So my promise today is to go over the foundations of uh, waste management with you guys about recycling and hopefully get your brains starting to think about this issue together with us. First, some definitions very quick. Waste electrical electronic equipment, or e-waste. Um, it's best defined in the European Union Directive. And that's what we usually use worldwide. But to simplify things, uh, anything, any equipment that works with an electric current at the end of life is going to become e-waste by the end of it. So we can think about your fridges, computers, your cell phones, but also wristwatches, the lighting room in this equipment, in this uh, lighting in this room, uh, remote controllers, and obviously PV is included in this category as well. There are some advantages to that and some disadvantages that we shall see today. Um, when we talk about e-waste, there are three main reasons why we care, why there's so much research in the area and why there's no, a lot of buzz around this kind of this specific waste stream. I'm going to cover them with you guys. We're going to go one by one. The first reason is that e-waste is the fastest growing uh, waste stream in the world and PV is a very good proxy for that. You guys know better than I do. We have uh, exponential growth in stock capacity. And it, that's, that's a very good example of how much waste we're talking about. It's been growing faster and faster in all different segments of the e-waste scenario. And you can think about, uh, you know, lamps. If you think about LEDs, we went from incandescent to fluorescent, and then LEDs. Each, each switch that we did, it's a whole new uh, incursion of e-waste that we're producing. Likewise, televisions. If you think about the old monitors or televisions, the CRT tubes, the big bulky ones, we then switched into the LCD and then the LEDs again. It's not because the equipment was you know, not working anymore, it's just because we had this disruption in technology that incurred and translated into more waste being generated. Uh, likewise, cell phones, I'm sure everybody here in the room has a cell phone, if not all of you, most of you. And the lifespan of cell phones have been decreasing over time. It's getting shorter and shorter, not necessarily because they're not working anymore, but because you know, the consumer demand side, it wants new features, it thinks its phone is backdated. And on the, demand, on the supply side, we also have faster and faster releases. So before, you know, 20 years ago, maybe it was a new model every three years. Then since the iPhone is one model every year, and recently we have two models every year, that just increases the frequency in which we change our equipment, and that increases the e-waste being produced. Right? So the advantage of working with uh, e-waste and PVs is that we always have, you know, 20 years in the future time frame, because these guys last between 20 and 30 years. So we, all can, we can always look 20 years in the past and know exactly what's arising right now. And this is completely different from people doing research on PV. You guys are looking at cutting edge technology. You, know, you start your PhD looking at one thing. Two years later, it's not even a thing anymore. You have to change your subject. In our case, we have 20 years to look in the past and know exactly what's showing up. Um, and one thing that happens is because of this exponential growth, there's a kind of an illusion that the volumes are never here. Because whenever, wherever you're in this curve, if you look, if you're in this point here in the curve and you look, five years in the future, the volumes are going to grow hugely, right? But that's always an illusion because then you're over here and you're still looking to the future and the volumes are going to be higher in the future. So when I first started looking at this about 10 years ago, 
The problem was 10 years away. Today, people still say it's 10 years away. So it's like a horizon. You never get close to it. But the reality is that volumes are already showing up, uh, especially in places in which PV is older, is installed earlier. But in Australia already, we have these guys showing up, and we have to have the infrastructure ready to deal with this. A very naive approach to determine how much e-waste we're going to have from PVs is because of this average lifespan from 20 to 30 years, is we just get 25 years, and we just you know, switch that x-axis in the future, right? So it looks something like this. And this is something that was done before, and this is naive because this would assume that our PVs are going to last the 25 years without any problems. But in reality, what we know is that we ha do have problems. So this is a um, graph from ARENA and the International Ener Energy Agency showing the two uh, type of losses. So you can see on the light gray down here, this is the regular loss scenario, and then the dark gray is the early loss scenario. And I just want to sh point out how different these two guys are in terms of volume. Right, can you look the volume here on the on the on this left y-axis? Um, and then this this analysis here, it still assumes 30-year average panel lifespan, even on the early loss scenario. And what it does to to calculate that difference there is that it considers the probability of failures. Right? So but I think that's still naive. I think what we're gonna see is actually greater than this. Because in addition to the failure modes, we still have two things that I think are being overlooked. And I'd love for us at Spree to start looking into this. One of them is the warranty. We generally take the warranty from the manufacturers to be something that we can rely on, and then we can project that into the future. But if you talk to any asset owners, any people owning, uh, you know, big landfill, uh, sorry, big uh, solar farms, you're gonna they're gonna tell you that they don't rely on the warranty whatsoever because the warranty is only as is only valid while the manufacturer is still a player. If it goes bankrupt, the warranty goes to waste, right? And um, because of that, last year we had a very good example of uh, you know, bankruptcy in a lot of different segments of the industry, uh, especially in an industry you have in where you have uh, razor thin margins. And then if you are relying on that warranty and your manufacturer is not playing a player anymore in the field, you don't, you don't get in anything from that warranty. So that's one of the things that we want to look into it. But the other thing is that, as you guys know better than I do, the efficiency, the commercial efficiency of PV is growing steadily over time. If you take a module, commercial module from seven years ago and a commercial module of today, you have that little boost in efficiency. At the same time, you know that the efficiency in the field drops as the panel is working. And that gap between the gain efficiency and the drop in efficiency, if we take a new module today, a new commercial module today, and a one that's seven years old, that, that difference in efficiency can be translated into dollars. If you have a solar farm, your the amount of electricity you generate is translated into the revenue you generate. And the moment that it makes financial sense for you to switch, you're going to switch. So you may switch perfectly fine modules for ones that are um, newer just because it makes financial sense to, make, to do so. And that's something that's often overlooked, and I think we shall start looking at this as soon as possible. We really can't wait for uh, enough volumes to you know, justify recycling. Um, there's two reasons for this. One, obviously, they always say that we need enough volumes to justify the economic side of it. But we need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place beforehand because there's a learning curve that we want to overcome before the big volumes come. And the second reason is because the whole PV industry is based on this idea of sustainability, of living, living sustainable as a whole society, right? And if we have modules showing up, even if it's not large quantities, and they're, but they're being denied by recyclers or by local councils, and they start ending up in the curbside or in riverbeds, we're going to have a very problem with our uh, image on the PV manufacturing side installation and every, everything we do here at Spree. So we definitely want to be ahead of this beforehand. Um, just talking about early losses and the reasons, you obviously have the uh, problems with the cells. So you can think about LID or anything like that. But also we need to take a couple steps back and think about the whole structure. So it's not only, if you look at this Irina report, it's not only cell problems. We also have uh, bad support and construction, mounting problems, degradation of the any reflective layer. We have discoloration of the encapsulant, electrical system failures, and things like that. So we need to look at the whole thing, not just the, the cell itself, or the module itself. And uh, one thing that they found on this report, again from Arena, is that 40% of their samples had micro cracks in the cell. And this is relevant because if you think about end of life, what happens is you have the whole manufacturer of the PV, you have, you know, the, you, you create the module, you transport it, you install it. But then, at the end of life, you need to decommission these guys, transport it back to a facility, process them, so you can extract that cell. So if it's 40% of them are broken on this first way, when we have the return trip, it's probably going to be way more than that. So if you're thinking about reusing these cells and making them into new modules, that might be a big problem we want to look into. 
Um, so this is all the first reason. Remember, I was going to tell you three reasons why it's relevant. The first reason is it's the fastest growing waste stream in the world. Second reason, it's that these guys are very valuable. E-waste in general is very valuable. On, I want to show you guys this. This is on the on this first column here. We have the average minimum content in a ore that we use to extract these guys, and minimum in terms of you know it's profitable to do so. We're actually going to do it. It's viable to do so. The second column here has the average concentration of different types. Again, e-waste is a very broad stream of waste. For, so for different types of waste, the concentration that we have of these same materials in electronic waste. And this third column, which is the one we're going to focus on, is the proportion between the two. Right? So if I take this first one and divide by this one. So what I want to show you guys is that if you look at copper, for instance, we have anything from 20 to 40 times more copper in electronic waste than we have in a, a copper ore. Likewise, we can look at uh, gold 300 times more, silver 30 times more, palladium 200 times more, and so forth. And then, obviously, you don't want to see this, but you actually want to see is the, this one here. Right? This, this is one for uh, PV. And uh, this is specifically for silicon PV. And the reason for that is today 95% plus of the market is silicon PV. And again, we can look back so we know exactly that the majority of waste coming in the next 20 years is going to be from silicon PV. So that's why this whole talk is focused on silicon PV. So I'm I have the same numbers from the, the last column. On this column here, now I have average content in sil silicon PV. And then the same column dividing. So Copper, we have anywhere from 1.2 to 2 times more copper in PV than we have in the ore. Silver, we can have anywhere from 2.6 to 6 times more silver than in the ore. And then aluminum, tin, and lead, we have less in the ore, but that's not the full story. Because uh, before I do that, just so you know, this high end on the silicon, on the silicon PV silver concentration can be compared, it's comparable to uh, high grade silver reserves, which is anywhere from 800 grams per ton to 1100 grams per ton. So if you have a stockpile of end-of-life PVs, you actually have a silver mine in your hands. And not just any silver mine, a very, very rare silver mine that we can't find. It's very rare to find nowadays, uh, high-grade silver. Um, but even the, um, these guys that are not as concentrated as the ore, if you guys think about, it's not only about the concentration, it's about the process that we need to make to be able to obtain this, this metal or this material that we're dealing with. So the way that mining works is that we actually have to dig a hole in the ground, we have to explode things, and then we take all this, these rocks and then we transport them to a facility and then we concentrate the thing that we want. So if this is the 30% aluminum, for instance, that we have in ore, we need to break it down and then concentrate the aluminum. And what we have by the end of it is aluminum oxide. That's not good enough. We want the metallic thing. So we need to put all this energy into actually recovering and reducing this aluminum and having the thing that we want. And for this, this, huge, this industry is huge, as you know, but in all this crushing, it's not as simple as it may sound. You have your jaw crushers, you have your cone crushers, your gyratory crushers, you have your roll crushers, you have your tooth rolls, you have your ball mills, you have your jigs, you have your uh, knife shredders, you have your hammer shredders. It's, this is only the beginning of the story. Right? There's, a whole, there's a whole industry around this, and they're usually used in line in a serious process. So you have used several different mills. It's not as simple as it sounds. And on the other hand, what we have here, on this you know, 10 to 20% aluminum concentration PV is the aluminum frame. And you pop those guys out, you can do that manually or in an automated fashion, and it's good to go. You can reuse that aluminum uh, as aluminum frames, or you can smelt it and do whatever you want with it. It's good to go. Nothing else is required. So just the concentration, not the full story. Looking into the energy inputs and the logistics behind it is actually something else that we want to be sure we're looking into. One thing that I would love for you guys to take from this talk is precisely this point, okay? I know that the concentrations, the absolute concentration might not be much in PV, but we always need to look at the concentration and how it compares to the primary uh, sourcing that we have from those materials, right? Primary source is always mining. Secondary source is, you know, end-of-life materials. And then if we look into the future for a bit, this is the, uh, the roadmap, PV roadmap. I know a lot of you guys tell me that you know, the, silver, the quantity of silver is decreasing over time and we should expect it to continue to decrease. This is milligrams of silver per cell and we see this downward trend. But remember, we're looking at concentration, not necessarily absolute quantities. And um, if we remove the aluminum frame, which is fairly easy to do, the concentration already pops right up, right? Because the amount of mass that we have is smaller. The concentration is still the same. Uh, if we look at glass, the tendency for glass is that we should expect to have less glass in the future, right? So this is uh, greater than three mils in thickness, and then we have uh, the yellow one is between two and three mils, and then we actually can have smaller than 
glass is 60 to 70 percent of the weight of the module. So if we're expecting a decrease in the amount of glass, what happens with the concentration of silver? Right? So even if the we have a decreased trend in the concentration of silver of milligrams per cell, if we're decreasing the amount of glass, we're actually increasing the concentration of silver. And again, keep this in mind. We need to compare this against the primary source, which is mining. What is the concentration of minerals, the grade or grade of silver? Well, guess what? It's been declining over time. This is the concentration for gold, okay? And these are for different countries. You can see the downward trend. This is concentration for uh, nickel and copper. Again, downward trend. And if we take an average, global average for silver, guess what? Downward trend. Those are values in grams per ton. So not only can we expect maybe uh, an increase in concentration in PV, but we should also expect a decrease in concentration for the main competitor for uh, a metal like silver. So that's the second reason, right? We Three reasons again. First reason, fastest growing waste stream in the world. Second reason, it's a valuable resource. E-waste in general, PV uh, within that e-waste. Now, third reason. Hazardous components. This, um, this idea is, again, I need to tell this several times, stress this. PV, uh, sorry, e-waste is a very broad category, right? So in general, they have hazardous waste, maybe more, maybe less. In general, we can speak about uh, flame retardants, we can speak about mercury, uh, cadmium, lead, uh, chromium, right, in general. What happens is that these guys, they can have a detrimental effect in human health, they can contaminate environments, they can uh, be a problem for fauna, flora, and it's so much cheaper to manage these guys before they spread out, they contaminate soil, water beds, uh, you know, in, in form of emissions go to the air. It's so much harder to capture them afterwards than beforehand much like uh, carbon dioxide, right? Um, in the case of PV specifically, these are the two, and again, crystalline silicon PV, these are the two you wanna look out for. And the way that we classify waste, this is probably something that a lot of you guys are not aware of, but the way that we classify waste, it varies from country to country, and, uh, but generally it's very similar, okay? So we can have general solid waste, restricted solid waste, and hazardous waste. In the case of PV, the amount of lead that we have automatically discards the possibility of being general solid waste. So it goes between these two guys. And to determine which of these two it is, what we do is the TCLP. That stands for uh, Toxicity Characteristic Leaching Procedure. And what we do is we subject the waste to this slightly acidic uh, solution. That the purpose of it is to simulate uh, rain, rain falling into the waste, or acidic rain in some cases. And we see how much actually leaks out for different you know, elements that we're uh, tracking. And in the case of the, this is the New South Wales EPA, the maximum limit for lead is 20 out of this test. Silver 20, fluoride 600. And the only, only reason why I included fluoride is because of the uh, PVF on the back sheet. And what we see is that this, these experimental results I did way back. This was for the Brazilian TCLP, which is slightly different for the, uh, than the Australian one. But still, we can, the comparison is still valid. And you can see it's generally above. So this classifies uh, PVs as hazardous waste. But there's two things that we need to be aware out of this result. The first thing is that, well, because of this, this um, result, in most legislations, PV is going to be considered a hazardous waste. But the second thing you want to take for this is that if we remove the lead, okay, if we manufacture PV without lead, and you guys know that lead is not one of the main things that we need in PV modules, not only it drops from being hazardous, but it drops from being a restricted solid waste and it goes back all the way to general solid waste because the other concentration of materials that we have are not enough to justify this uh, different group here. So not only we go from the worst case scenario, we go to the best case scenario, not the intermediate one. And that's significant. The other thing uh, I want to tell you guys is that there's a small caveat on this because when we do this experiment, right, this leaching procedure, it, it's made on a bench scale with a jar this big. So we can't fit a whole module in there. So we need to break it down. And when we're breaking it, we're already changing the structure of the PV. So we're doing a paper right now on the toxicity of PV, and then one of the things that we found is that, well, there's a lot of mitigation things in place, like layer blocking layers before, right? The glass is one, obviously, and then the encapsulant is the second. So just to be very clear, if it's on the field, we're not going to expect any leaching whatsoever, right? We have those systems in place to stop that from happening. But the moment that we have a, it breaks, the glass breaks, then we have one of the layers gone, but we still have the encapsulant there, so we should not expect any, leach any leaching of lead to occur anyways. But again, remember that we're looking at end of life. So we have decommissioned these modules. They might be going um, elsewhere. They might be completely broken now and then being stockpiled in the rainfall. And worst case scenario, they're being landfilled. 
if it's being land filled, then we have the compression, and then we're breaking them more, and then we're exposing it, and then the, the real danger shows up. Uh, but again, just to be very clear, we should not expect any PV working in the field to leach any lead. So I've covered the three reasons why e waste is significant, and then within those reasons, the, uh, the specifics for PV. And hopefully you guys are in agreement with me that it's something that's worthwhile and we want to do. We want to explore and do more research on and make sure the infrastructure is in place. But in addition to that, I want to include a couple more reasons. Well, PV, the idea of making, of going towards PV technology and generating electricity with PV is that we want to make it a more sustainable world, more sustainable future. And then again, like I said, for the image of PV, we want to make sure that end of life is all com comprehended within that uh, sustainable future that we're looking at. And the other thing is that if you think about renewable energy, the idea is precisely that we're not extracting resources from the ground to generate energy in a power plant and then you know, emitting CO2 and then going back and extracting more coal, gas, or oil, whatever we're doing. We have that circular pattern going on with renewable energy. The same thing has to happen with our um, waste, right? So if we're generating, if we're using all these resources to create these panels, we want to make sure that by the end of the life, we have a circular economy. This is a very big buzzword right now. Circular economy that's capable of getting these resources and putting them back into use, whether it's for manufacturing new PVs or something else. The other thing is that there are, there's, there's the issue of the scarcity of materials, and we, there's a possibility of a silver shortage soon. I'm not going to go into much details because Brett's giving a presentation uh, next month and he's going to tell you all about it. But this is a paper from 2013 that predicts that in anywhere from 5 to 50 years we can have a silver depletion. And silver is important not only for the PV industry but for other, other industries. So you want to make sure that we are grabbing all the silver we can from these end of life modules. And the last reason, especially here for Spree, is that I think this area, this end of life area, is, some, is a place that we can give a lot of industry um, value. We can provide a lot of in industry value. Right? There's a whole world of possibilities we can uh, provide from the school, coming from the school, not only for PV manufacturers, but also for local councils, policymakers, and also for the recycling industry. So all these reasons come together in why we want to make sure that we're looking into this issue here at Spree. So now that hopefully I've convinced you, let's look at the bit of the foundations on waste management. Um, waste management has generally three stages when we're looking at, for, so we're, we're trying to determine the end of life recycling rate. We need to look into these three stages, the collection, the pre-processing, and the end processing. So even if we, are, we have amazing process capabilities and we are able to extract 100% on the pre-processing and 100% efficiency on the end processing, but we're only collecting half of the waste out there, our recycling rate is going to be 50%. Right? So all these, three, all these stages, they, need to, they combine to give us the final result on the recycling rate. And then obviously these stages depend on the type of waste stream we're deal dealing with. If we're looking into municipal solid waste, the, the, the red bins in your homes, the household waste, it's going to be a different type of collection, different, different type of pre-processing, and so forth. Um, if we're looking into e-waste, for instance, it's different. You've probably seen here in the Tyree, we have those little uh, containers to put batteries. That's already a pre-sorting that we're doing beforehand for, to ease the collection and lower that cost. Likewise, if you ever worked in a chemical bench here or at SURF, there's a difference for when you're using metals, uh, chemicals with metals and without metals, that's already pre-sorting so that we facilitate the liquid waste treatment afterwards. Um, so looking into the collection phase, first phase, we have some insights from France, from Europe. They have been doing this for a while. Uh, and we can already anticipate some problems. So a couple of data from that, they, that they gave us, uh, this is from PV Cycle, is that 90% of the waste that you collect, PV waste they collect, is standard, meaning that is the sort of PV that comes to mind when you guys think about a PV module. The other 10% are tailor-made PV, so PVs inside a suitcase or things that have, you know, bulkier frames for whatever reason. And within the um, crystalline silicon category, 5% of them show some type of abnormality. Whether it's uh, non-standard lamination, it's not suitable for the automation line they have, or they're rolling and broken. In this case here, we can see um, these guys are not only broken, but the, the frames have been removed. And this is a problem because, again, the leaching thing that we were talking before, but also because one of the main revenues for the recyclers is actually the frame. So if people are removing the frame beforehand to make a buck out of it, the recyclers might fall short by the end of the, the process. Uh, so this is significant. The other thing is, this is a picture for twisted modules. 
And the removal of the frame is something that's well established already. It's quite easy to do. You can do it manually, or you can do it in an automated fashion. There are equipment that you can buy off the shelf that pop the frame out. But when you have modules like this, which are completely twisted or broken, they do not fit the machine, so you have to do it manually, and that obviously increases the cost of your processing line. So, you know, silly things that you might not think are meaningful are when we're looking at end-of-life problems. Another thing that you might find funny is that this is the collection in the French Guiana, connection of PV end-of-life modules by canoe. And this might sound far-fetched, but we live in Australia, right? This is actually a problem here. Uh, this is a picture I took of a collection truck, waste collection truck in Fraser Island. For reference, uh, if you guys don't know where Fraser Island is, it's just that island there. Uh, north of Brisbane, and it's not even very far away from, you know, the main population axis in Australia. But fact is, there is waste being generated there, and we need to collect that somehow. And that obviously increases the cost, and remote areas is something that Australia knows a lot about. So, you know, these small things end up being very cost, a problem in the cost of the collection, and something we want to be addressing when we're looking into these end-of-life issues. So, moving from the collection stage into the pre-processing and the end processing stage. This is a flowchart. I'm not going to have time to go into detail because time is short. But what I want to show you guys is just this separation here, okay? So we have the e-waste, we've collected it, and then generally the pre-processing pre -processing involves some type, type of manual sorting or shredding or both. And sometimes do just doing that is enough to recover the material you're looking for. Again, going back to the frames, that's a good example. You just pop the frames out, you're good to go. But sometimes you need to do more, so you, need, you have all these mechanical processes that, um, you know, leverage on the difficult, different physical properties of materials to be able to separate them. So we're talking about uh, density separation, magnetic separation, electrostatic separation, optical separation, and so forth. Uh, and then if that's not enough, then we go to the end processing stages in which we actually do the, the more complex uh, chemical around the recovery of the material. So if you have plastics, ceramics, or metals, it doesn't matter, they all have their own types of end processing. I think metals are usually the easiest one to understand. So you have your pyrometallurgical processes, your hydrometallurgical processes, the things that we do to refine that, um, that metal. Right, so again, looking at PV, the frame is a very good example of something you can extract without needing any end processing. But then if we want to extract the silver, once we've concentrated the silver, we need to go and do, do one of these routes to be able to extract the silver. Again, just for your uh, information, Australia generally, because of the legislation, the regulations in place, pre-processing sometimes is called also initial, uh, oh sorry, first stage recycling, and the end processing is sometimes called downstream recycling. So let's talk a bit about recycling. So what, when we do the, so there's, again, there's two types, right? The pre-processing and the end processing. One follows the other. And, uh, when we're talking about pre-processing for PV, what we're generally talking about is the lamination, separating the layers of the PV module. And uh, this is something that I find quite funny when I was preparing this presentation, is that our main challenge when the lamination, the main challenge is the delamination, not the end processing. And within the lamination, the main challenge is the EVA. The reason why I find it funny is because I'm thinking of you guys developing these new cells and you're thinking about micro scale, sometimes even nano scale, and you have the cell, you're trying to make it tandem, you're looking at these very small layers you're trying to put to increase the efficiency, and here you are worrying about EVA, which is something you don't even bother about. I'm sure never, none of you thought about EVA before as being a problem, uh, because EVA is very good. Uh, EVA is very good for its purpose. It's cheap, it's cross-linked, it's stable, it's transparent, right? It's everything you want. From our point of view, it's horrible because it's cheap, it's cross-linked, it's transparent, and it's stable. Being cheap means that we don't get much value out of it, it doesn't add much value to the end-of-life product. Being um, cross-linked means that although it's a thermoplastic, we can't really recycle it because the cross-linked portion of it makes it um, rubber-like. And being, uh, what else, stable means that whatever you throw at it, it's going to withstand. So we've tried every single thing from acid solutions to, you know, I, I can't even start listing them. Uh, and only a few work, and even the ones that work have it, their caveats. And being transparent, obviously you need that for this light to come through and reach the cell, but for us, it means that optical properties, are, uh, optical separation is compromised. So the options that we have for PV recycling, all right, this is just a, a breakdown of the patents uh, from TAS-12 and how they're broken down. So we can do it chemically, thermically, we can do it mechanically, optically, or we can combine these different types to get the optimum result. Mechanical, you can see it's uh, the biggest one. This is mainly because it's the cheapest one. 
And what I want to do with the time that I have left is actually just go through them quickly and just you know, give you an idea of how we do these things and what are the caveats around them. Obviously, these different types of processing, they have different costs. This is a work here from Spree, this is from Wrong. Uh, and whenever we're dealing with, uh, land, uh, sorry, with uh, recycling, we're competing with landfill. And that's a problem. So if there's no regulations in place to stop waste from going to landfill, we're competing with the cost of landfill, which can be very cheap. And in Australia, because we have a lot of land, landfill is very cheap. Uh, and then, again, these different types of recycling are going to have, obviously, different costs. So you always want to be sure that we're tracking also the cost of these processes to make sure we're, we can decrease this cost and make it viable. So chemical recycling, this is a paper that we published this year. This uses toluene to try to uh, you know, tackle the EVA. And the, what the toluene does is that it twirls part of the EVA and it dissolves part of it. And if you do that, if you leave long enough uh, a long enough time, what you can do is actually get a separation of the layers. You can see a time lapse of how the, the back sheet is separating slowly from the rest of the module. And as a re end result, what we get is this separation here. So this is a very good example of pre-processing. Right? The glass is good to go. The aluminum frame is good to go. You can see the back sheet here almost left intact. Here's the other half of the back sheet. And these two guys here, these two are the mush that we get from the cell. You know, the, the silver, the tabbing, uh, the EVA, they're all contained in that mush. So that will require end processing for us to be able to extract the rest of it. Um, thermal, I don't have great pictures for thermal, but I know First Solar used to have an um, industrial plant in which they did thermal. Uh, matter of fact for thermal is that if you place the modules in about 500 Celsius, what you get is that about 20, uh, about 80% of the back sheet is um, degraded, and about 100% of the EVA is degraded at 500-ish. So that means that if we place the PV module in the furnace at about 500, between 500 and 600, we can remove the layers that we want to remove so that we can delaminate the module. This here just, this is a work from one of my uh, master students. Uh, this is just showing different um, effects that you can have different temperatures. And if you don't have the right temperature at the right time, you end up with this residue, this black residue, which is part of the back sheet, part of the EVA. And if you do it right, this is a picture that she got it right. So this, you can see just the glass in the cell showing up there. The problem with uh, thermal recycling is that it's generally, well, the first problem is that because of the halogens that we have in the PV, uh, you can have nasty chemicals coming in, out as emission. And to avoid to do the second problem is that it's precisely the cost. The thermal process is something that it only costs a lot in comparison to the others. And if you think about it, trying to target is just the EVA in the back sheet, not everything else. But we actually have to heat up every, everything else if we're doing thermal processing. The last caveat on thermal is that often it breaks the glass because of the, the thermal shock. Um, if you look at mechanical processing, this is a work that we did using electrostatic separation. So the way that this works is that we shred the module yeah, into pieces, and then we pass through this uh, electrostatic separator that's going to um, take advantage of the different physical properties, the conductive properties, electroconductive pro properties of the materials to try to separate them. And what we have here is a, a picture of the result. This is mainly the glass and s the, the metals. The middle infraction has most of the silicon and a bit of the metals, and then the uh, non-conductive fraction has the polymers, mostly the, the back sheet. Um, another mechanical example, this is to show you how simple things can be when we're dealing with mechanical. This is just a process in which we shred the module and then we sieve it, and then we press it through different sieves, try to separate the different particle sizes. And just by doing that, we found that we can concentrate the copper in the, the largest particle size, so particle size is greater than one mil and the silver concentrates in smaller particle size, more smaller than 0.5 mil. We also found in this work that the polymer concentrates on the, on the larger particle size. And then often just using one of these guys is not enough. We want to do a combination of them to get the optimum result, not only in terms of the efficiency, but also in terms of cost. This is uh, one example of combination. This is, again, from one of my students. Uh, what she's doing here is she's using uh, She's using this piece of equipment here to cut the back sheet. So she does very thin cuts just on a, on a very thin piece of, of, of the module so that she only targets the back sheet. And after that, she does that, so you can see the back sheet being removed here. And this is the, the module. You're looking from the back, you see the, the, the module without the back sheet afterwards. And after that, she does a thermal process to remove uh, the EVA, and then she ends up with the, this is the glass, this is the tabbing, and pieces of the, of the cell. Uh, another example of combination here is this paper that we did on the recovery of silver. And what we do, let me just separate these two parts here. What we do here is that we first mill the module or shred it, and then we sieve it. 
and then we concentrate it on the smaller fraction, like I said before, it concentrates the silver. And then we can do a thermal process to remove the EVA, or we don't have to do it. And once we do that, what we do is the end processing, so we uh, put the, the shredded module into a nitric acid solution, and then we precipitate the silver with uh, sodium chloride. And what we get as, as an end result is the silver chloride, which is this white powder you can see here. And this is an example of, you know, pre-processing, which we shred and sieve, and then you can have thermal processes here, so mechanical and, and thermal. And then we have an example here of end processing. Assuming that you have been able to delaminate successfully the, the cell, then you have other options, and we have the end processing options. And just an, as an example, this is a work, again, from Rong here from uh, NSW. And this work here, once you have the cell delaminated, what you can do is you can do um, electrolysis, a kind of electrolysis process, in which you have your cell as an anode and a, uh, a mesh, this is a mesh of titanium as a cathode. And what we're doing here is we're depositing the silver in the metallic form in this, uh, this titanium mesh. This was uh, dark gray when we first started. And by the end of the process, you had this, uh, you know, very shiny silver uh, white powder here. So this is metallic silver, good to go. You can do, do, what, do whatever you want to do with the silver. Um, so I'm running out of time, and I just want to go through some final thoughts with you guys. Um, this is the waste hierarchy. This is what you usually uh, use to determine what to do with the waste. So the first thing we want to do is prevent. And I want to point out that recycling is not the first thing, right? Recycling is actually one of, on the bottom of the ladder because recycling is not supposed to be the first option. It's supposed to be our fourth option in that case there. So when we're looking at uh, PVs, right? PVs are comprehended within electronic waste, e-waste, but it has some particularities. One of them is that prevention is not really what we want to do. We want to push the industry. We want to have greater install capacity. You want to have more social modules be installed, not less. So this is already a caveat in respect to this you know, general approach that we take to waste. But we do want to minimize. And we can minimize by uh, different ways. One of them is we can design for sustainability. This is something that we here at Spree can assist with. Um, this can be as straightforward as removing the lead and you know, making this uh, mass produced. Um, but also, we can design for sustainability in the way that we, it's easier to disassemble and to delaminate. Uh, possibly removing the EVA like a polo, so a polo solar does. Um, other things we can do here is just increase the lifetime of the module. If you can increase the lifetime, you're already minimizing the amount of waste that's coming out of it. Um, in terms of reuse, reuse should be uh, prior prioritized in respect to recycling. And then, again, Spree has a lot to offer in that sense. We can try to evaluate the modules still in the field, try to lower the cost so that we don't have to sort it afterwards. We can sort it beforehand. Um, and then we can, you know, send recycling modules that have to be recycled to recycling plants, modules that can be reused to reuse facilities that are going to do the distribution. Uh, a very good example of this is Richard's project in Vanuatu, in which he takes end of, uh, you know, old modules to be reused. Um, we have a lot of capabilities, and we're already doing a lot of life cycle assessment to try to evaluate the environmental impact, not only of the installation, the production, transportation of modules, but also the end of life and how to minimize, you know, pr create these processes and minimize their environmental impact. Um, techno economic analysis is something that we're also doing a lot at Spree, and we want to do more. We want to be sh sure we're doing more because we need more studies to make, you know, the end of life viable. Uh, at the moment, it's not viable. The, the, the revenue you can take out of it is not enough to cover the costs, which takes us right into the next topic, which is policy. Right? This is another topic that we here at Spree can help a lot, policy making. Uh, whether it's something like the banning of sending uh, waste to landfill like Victoria did, uh, but also creating a product stewardship like is the case for e-waste in Australia right now, but it's not the case for PV. So that stewardship can have a gate fee that's enough just to cover the difference between the revenue you can make and the cost of processing waste while the volumes are not here to justify the whole thing. And then finally, there's also the capability that we're looking into, but we want to do more on the collection phase. Like I said, collection is often overlooked, but it's very important. So we want to be sure that we're looking at collection and reverse logistics of it. Uh, and again, looking at um, the LCAs and the techno-economic part of it, trying to minimize cost and environmental impact. One of the things that we found here at SPRI uh, this is the work from Marina. She found that actually the transportation, the collection of modules, is one of the main uh, impacts in the environmental sense. Mo more often, it's greater than the actual processing, the pre-processing and the end processing. So this is what I had to tell you guys today. We only scratched the surface. Uh, try to cover a lot of things in very little time. So I'll be 
I'm very happy to come back and talk more about uh, you know, policy regulations, talk about more of our LCA studies, our LCC studies, the cost studies, technical, technical within the, the recycling. This QR code gives you a list to the references I've used if you want to um, explore that later. Um, I'd like to conclude to say, saying that I'm very impressed with the work being done at Spree. Uh, hopefully I was able to provoke your thoughts around this end of life issue and get your brains going to think about this as well. You guys know where to find me. You can shoot an email. We can talk more about this if you have any ideas on this topic. We'd love to get more people involved in this issue. Thank you very much. Pablo, for that, I, we're ready to take questions if there are any questions from the floor. Um, Richard Corkish, over that way. Uh, Pablo, great, great presentation. Very, very well done. Thank you very much. Um, so you covered a lot of, a lot of ground there. Um, so one, there's another toxic, though, that you didn't mention, and I wonder if you uh, have any comments about it. Um, um, potential toxic, possible toxic, I'm not sure. Um, so back in 2019, I think there was a big fuss in India particularly, and it seemed to be mostly confined to India, about antimony ink in the cover glass for PV. And it sort of all went quiet, it seems, and didn't seem to generate any, um, yeah, it sort of went away. But is that a real issue? Um, yeah, so I would love to have covered that, but I had to remove that part from the talk because of timing constraints. But actually, yes, let's talk about antimony quickly. So this is, uh, this is a study from Sustainability Victoria, published. And they actually they hired this company to do a work on, uh, characterize the glass from PV. And what they found is that there is a little bit of antimony on the glass. And this is backed up by a patent that we found that in the, in the indicates that it, we can have antimony in PV glass. So, but there's a, there are a couple of problems. One of the problems that I found with this study in particular is that if you look at some other thing that you found in the glass, they found uh, quite a lot of silicon oxide, uh, sodium oxide, um, aluminum oxide, and titanium oxide. So that indicates to me a bit of cross-contamination, perhaps between the components of PV, and also perhaps with their shredding equipment they're using. Um, in addition to that, what we looked into, we're doing a paper on toxicity, and that's why I have all this information, but we looked into, you know, this is a, a glass supplier. This is a, the chemical fact sheet from the glass supplier. They have no mention to antimony whatsoever. This is a FRELP. This is a process developed in Europe for the recovery of end-of-life PVs, and they also didn't find any antimony when they're doing their characterization in the glass. And myself, I did some experiments on characterizing glass, and I didn't find anything as well. So, this is not enough for us to conclude there's no antimony in PV glass, and that's not an issue, but um, I wonder still if it's, you know, maybe cross-contamination because we haven't seen any reliable sources with this, or if it's maybe one manufacturer or one period of time that they use that, and that's a very, very uh, particular problem that it's not, you know, that broad and that comprehensive for PV in general. Thanks for a great talk, Pablo. Um, I'm just wondering, with the issues on the ability to recycle modules and challenges, should we be, as an industry, looking to standardise module sizes? Because currently, companies are going to a whole range of different wafer sizes, meaning that there's a whole range of different modules. Um, that's an excellent question, actually, because, yeah, well, it, it really depends, right? If you're looking from the end-of-life perspective, that will be amazing. That will be great, and that will be definitely lower the costs of the processing. But at the same time, what would be amazing for us, as, an, as a, for looking specifically at end-of-life modules, is that the PV modules only last five years, for instance, because then we can have that circular economy going all the way. We have that, those PV modules coming out of the field and going back into manufacturing. So it's not necessarily the best, what that, the best for the industry as a whole. Um, in terms of standardizing, yes, I think it would be good. One of the things that we found, uh, again, this is a, a a uh, spree study is that one of the main problems we, we can reuse cells so we can extract them and reuse them in new modules that's perfectly uh, technically feasible but because they keep changing like you said that gets in the way of actually putting them back into manufacturing of what's being done today in addition to that one thing that we might look into the future uh, Martin gave a talk this year in which he said that we're getting to the limit of the sizes because of 
capability of you know handling the the, the modules by because of the size and the and the, the weight for one person to, to maneuver those, and also the capabilities of shipping because of the size of the containers. So that might end up making the industry do do that standardization, not because of the end of life problem, but because of these other problems related to the logistics, and that might be beneficial for us uh, in the end of life issue. Yeah. Great. And I had another question. Have you looked into um, silicone-based encapsulants as whether they're potentially better from a recycling um, recovery? Um, there is, I haven't particularly, not, not me, but I've seen, read more than one paper that uh, they try to do, they try to attack different encapsulants using different uh, solutions, particularly organic solutions. And EVA was the worst one, meaning that anything that you do differently, even if it's silicone, and silicone is still stable, very stable, which I mean is definitely something we're looking for, but it's easier to attack than EVA. So that's definitely a potential going forward, yeah, something that would be good for us. Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I had a question about this graph about the silver concentration over time, because I think it stopped at 2012. Do you have more recent data on that? Um, and the, which one? Let's go back and which one. Um, I think you showed a couple materials and then basically the yeah, worldwide decline of silver. This one? No, maybe the next slide. This one? Yes, and then I think that probably, yeah. So, um, I mean, probably you know better, like, did it really decline, like, did this decline continue, or...? Um I don't know the answer to that. The reason is, it's, it's very hard to get this, this um, kind of information because you need to go into the, the um, geolo geological survey for different countries and try to extract what's happening. But the way that this works is that the, the low-hanging fruits are the ones that we get first. So those are the ones with the greater concentration because it's, the, the, it's better for, from a profit cost uh, point of view. And then as technology evolves, then the ones that are untapped become viable. It's the same thing with petroleum, right, if you're trying to extract petroleum. So the tendency is always for it to decrease unless there's like a revolution in technology that allows you to now find reserves that were before, uh, you know, untapped and you couldn't find them before. But this is generally the trend. I don't know if it continue uh, going to 2021. That's something we can look into, but you know, just general trend. That's it. Yeah. Um, uh, so thank you, Pablo. Um, I'm interested to know if you're working with industry partners here in Australia uh, to um, uh, to see how uh, it, with these technologies and these ideas, um, and also when you expect the volumes in Australia to be, re you know, really enough to drive a business around recycling? That's a very tricky question because they are enough, they are enough, but you need to have a lot of uh, capital to be able to sustain uh, the long run of, you know, capitalizing on the, on the, on the capturing of this resource and then uh, processing it in batches as opposed to trying to have a continuous process. So it's, you can have a viable business today if you are uh, working with PV and you have other sources of revenue, not only PV. But uh, going back to your first question, yes, we're working with a lot of industry partners. There are uh, a lot of small players showing up in Australia in the last three years especially. Here in New South Wales we work with... Uh, they're all very interested in PV and they're trying to you know, find the best way forward. The current situation in Australia is that right now what's being done is mostly the PVs are collected, they're stockpiled, and the frames are removed and sold. So we have this stockpiling of the laminates and then what to do with these laminates. We here in New South Wales University, we just developed a new process that is capable of addressing these low volumes with a very cheap, very low impact solution, which draws back on the one that I've shown you with the um, electric static separation. This one here, where is it? This one here. Sorry, I have too many processes. This one here. So we, we actually improved upon this one and we found a, a way to do this very cheaply and with a low environmental impact. And this is a solution for the industry right now. So we are, we're definitely looking into working with them and getting this off the ground. Whew. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'd like you to join me in thanking Pablo Diaz for that fabulous talk. <laughs>